Coming up next, the story of the most famous grammatically incorrect rock solo in history. This legendary riff, it came to the guitarist in a dream. Uh, he rolled out of bed and he recorded it first thing. The funny thing is, he meant for this riff, the riff heard around the world, to be a horn arrangement. Thank goodness that didn't take. When he showed it to the singer in his band, the front man went nuts for it. He wrote the greatest middle finger to the man lyrics in the rock canon. And then to top it all off, it got banned for being too suggestive. Story of a true classic is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever sat uh, at a jukebox for like 10 or 15 minutes trying to select the perfect songs to play, you're going to love this channel. I used to do it back in the day all the time. The stories directly from the legends. Make sure to subscribe below and click the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. And take a second look at our Patreon. That helps us keep this a daily channel and you get exclusive content. Many have called it the most influential guitar riff ever played. And it was most certainly an explosion on radio that ignited hundreds, if not thousands of bands. It all started in the year 1965 when the Rolling Stones released I Can't Get No Satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. An instant smash with that irresistible guitar riff. An anthemic shouted out loud chorus. It just captivated the social spirit of the mid-60s. The song was neither grammatically or politically correct, with its double negative title and its audacious lyrics about sexual frustration and the machination of commercialism. A middle finger to the man, if you will. It was a lot of things, many things. It was the first number one song for the Rolling Stones in America. Topped the pop chart for four weeks, and it ranked as the third biggest single of the year by Billboard magazine behind uh, another song with a parenthetical title, I Can't Help Myself, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch. That was at the number two spot. And Sam Sham and the Pharaoh's Wooly Bully finishing with Top Supremacy for 1965. Tell you, one of the greatest years for pop music ever. Satisfaction, it also went to number one in Ireland, in Australia, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, South Africa, and Austria. It was the fourth number one single in the UK for the Stones. Now, when Satisfaction first came out, commercial radio stations in Europe wouldn't touch it. Labeling the song is uh, too suggestive. However, pirate radio stations that didn't have a valid license to broadcast, they were all over the song. And the outlaw airplay generated such a huge buzz for the song, eventually every station with a stick was forced to play it. I Can't Get No Satisfaction was another classic that was conceived during the REM sleeping phase. Just incredible how often that has happened in the rock era. On May 6, 1965, the Rolling Stones were scheduled to perform for about 3,000 people at Jack Russell Stadium in Clearwater, Florida, as one of the stops uh, in their first U.S. tour. An altercation broke out between police and some of the concert goers. Now, there are several different versions of what actually happened, but the St. Petersburg Times reported that some 200 fans were involved in the melee forced the Stones to abort their performance after playing just four songs. Other accounts from patrons at the event claimed that the incident took place before the concert, and the Stones pulled up in their limos, saw the chaos, and uh, hightailed it out of the stadium, never leaving the vehicles and never playing a note. Uh, again, a couple stories there. Later that night, actually that same night, Keith Richards had uh, dozed off in his room at the Jack Tar Harrison Hotel, and a riff came to him in his sleep. When he awakened, he rolled out of bed, and he quickly grabbed an acoustic guitar and a Phillips cassette player to record the riff that he had dreamed about. 
while he was recording himself playing the guitar, <laughs> he actually fell back asleep. And when he played the tape to listen to what he had recorded, uh, he heard about two minutes of acoustic guitar licks followed by sounds of him snoring. True story. Mick Jagger wrote lyrics around Keith's riff a few days later. Now, the first version of the Satisfaction was recorded at Chess Studios in Chicago. And the band recalls that it sounded like a folk song, which Brian Jones actually played the harmonica on that track. Richards, he didn't really like the song in its original folky style. As Jagger recalled, Richards felt what he had created was just a silly kind of riff. Uh, Keith Richards envisioned that his guitar riff would be replaced by a horn section, giving the track, you know, an Otis Redding vibe. Yeah, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay. However, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get the riff to be played in a distorted fashion through the amps. Uh, when the band relocated uh, at RCA Studios uh, to record the final version of Satisfaction, Richards ran his guitar through a Maestro Fuzz Tone fuzz box that he got from Gibson to create the famous distortion effect on Satisfaction. The fuzz box helped sustain the notes uh, to sketch out the intended horn section. All along, Richards had it in his head that the guitar was just a placeholder for horns. But the band thought the distorted guitar riff sounded amazing and very unusual, while Richards insisted that you know, it sounded gimmicky and pressed for a horn arrangement to replace the guitar. It's just unbelievable to me. Now, as we go behind uh, this revolutionary song further, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the frames of my choice. One of my favorite features of Zenny that I've ordered with every one of my pairs, they're custom-made clip-on sunglasses. You can turn any pair of Zenny's into sunglasses. Check it out at zenny.com. You'll really like it. So apparently, a rather hostile argument ensued with Richards and Jagger wanting the horns and the rest of the band and the production crew, for that matter, voting in favor of keeping the distorted guitar effect with no changes. Richards and Jagger were outvoted, so they scrapped the horn section idea and they stayed with the distorted guitar sound. Now, in addition to using the fuzz box, uh, Richards also played clean guitar licks in the recording uh, with Brian Jones strumming an acoustic guitar throughout the track. Richards had to switch between the distorted and the clean tones uh, since the recording sessions took place a few years before multi-tracks and overdubs. One can hear Richards switching on his fuzz with an audible click in between Jagger singing Get No at about 36 seconds into the track. No. There's another interesting part of the song at about 1 minute and 35 seconds in where Richards stomped his fuzz box a little late, slightly missing his cue, and the riff is played a tad behind, but Keith just kept on rocking. No. No. Keith Richards didn't think for one second that Satisfaction was a hit, and he was adamant about the song not being released as a single. Now, in addition to disliking the song's arrangement, Richards was also worried that he may have unintentionally got the idea for that riff from either uh, Nowhere to Run by Martha and the Vandellas, which was you know, one of the hottest songs in early 1965. To run to, Keith also feared he may have unconsciously arrived at the song title by borrowing a line from a song by Chuck Berry. You know, it was one of his heroes. Chuck's rollicking tune, 30 Days, included the lyric, I can't get no satisfaction from the judge. I don't get no satisfaction from the judge. But once again, Keith was clearly outvoted by the rest of the Stones, and the rest is history, as they say. Oh, thank the heavens above that the Stones outvoted Richards so many times. Now, except for the catchy I Can't Get No Satisfaction title and chorus, Mick Jagger wrote all of the lyrics for the song, uh, following in the footsteps of the revolutionary songwriters like uh, Woody Guthrie uh, and Bob Dylan. Mick Jagger demonstrated his just gifted lyricism by mixing 
hip pop vernacular with biting social commentary on satisfaction. Uh, Jagger's editorial pounces on what he saw as two sides of America, the real and the phony, and even over a half a century later, the lyrics still resonate with that power and what's going on. Mick sang about a man searching for authenticity, but not finding it. The lyrics of Satisfaction released the singer's dismay and confusion with the increasing media commercialism, where radio broadcasts of what he called uh, useless information. And a man on television is telling him how white his shirts can be, but he can't be the man because he doesn't smoke the same cigarettes as me. That part of the song was an obvious reference to the iconic Marlboro Man uh, cowboy that was constantly on TV and print ads of the day. Mick detailed the stress of being a celebrity and the strains of touring the globe, doing this and signing that. Now, the line about not getting any girl reaction was very controversial. Uh, it was interpreted uh, by some listeners and radio programmers as meaning a girl that is willing to give of herself. The Stones also had to alter the lyric when they performed the song on their third appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. That was in early 66. Uh, the trying to make some girl line was bleeped out by the show's censors since um, it's really imaged as a family show. On the band's fifth appearance on Sullivan in 1967, they were once again censored while performing Let's Spend the Night Together and they acquiesced to change the line to let's spend some time together. Just talked about this uh, a couple months ago, but Jim Morrison, Ever the Rebel, didn't kowtow to Sullivan's request a short time later when he was asked to censor Light My Fire. Girl, we get Gotta respect that. Back to satisfaction though, here's the thing. You can really feel Jagger's frustration in his powerful lead vocal on Satisfaction. I mean, from the first verse to the climactic uh, shouting of the song's chorus, I can't get no satisfaction. It's regarded by many as Mick Jagger's finest performance. No. Ultimately, Mick certainly learned all about the enormity of American commercialism and took full advantage of it on the Stones' lucrative concert tours that would follow, as well as uh, big money licensing and merchandising deals. On this epic rock standard, Charlie pounds away like an r &B journeyman, occasionally adding tiny fills to the driving mix. And of course, Charlie is the rolling stone that leads the charge into Satisfaction's timeless and decisive exclamation, hey, 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 that's what I say. Charlie Watts will be sorely missed, like I said, as one of the truly frontline soldiers who brought our world rock and roll through his just explosive drumming. Now, Satisfaction has been covered by many, um, including the artist that Keith Richards originally fashioned the song after, the late great Otis Redding, who didn't care for the original version by the Stones. So in his interpretation, among other changes, he replaced the fuzz with the horns, just as Keith imagined it. But he thought that was pretty cool the first time he heard it. Some of the other names that have remade Satisfaction include Britney Spears, The Residents, and Devo. I can't get no satisfaction. Which we're gonna cover that uh, version in a while. The bottom line, if we listed every song or artist who was directly influenced by I Can't Get No Satisfaction, we'd be here for weeks. The list is very long indeed. Now, one of the songs that I think was directly inspired by I Can't Get No Satisfaction that I want to cover here is one of my favorite bands, one that we'll cover in more detail in the future. Uh, the pioneers of alternative music, The Replacements, with their heart-wrenching and just genuine no-holds-barred assessment of life unsatisfied. It's almost like the, I can't get no satisfaction for Generation X. Paul Westerberg, an unabashed disciple of the music of the Stones and a big star amongst others, 
uh, was the precursor to Nirvana as the de facto spokesman for my generation, for sure. But a bit more underground. Uh, he followed the blueprint of I Can't Get No Satisfaction. You know, about being angry and disjointed and, and confused in this thing called life. Westerberg said about the song that uh, may have been about his band, The Replacements, more than anything else. He said, and I quote, it was just uh, the feeling that uh, we were never going anywhere and the music we were playing is not the music I feel and I don't want to do and I don't know how to express myself. I felt that one to the absolute bone when I did it, end of quote. So Go back and listen to Unsatisfied, truly one of the great songs of the 80s. The replacements just kill it. You know, the Stones most certainly wrote the flagship song about to feeling disenchanted, misunderstood, disappointed, downcast, frustrated, and crestfallen. And from it, other bands in tune with this spirit have helped to, to deepen those feelings for all generations to give us more understanding to cope. When I first heard, I can't get no satisfaction as a child, it awakened a feeling of protest against my parents at that time who just grounded me from uh, TV for not cleaning my room. I was about eight years old and the radio was blaring this song and I'm sure I'd heard it before, but in my disaffection, it resonated wholly with me at that moment. And every year since then, it has resonated more strongly from having to do my homework in my teens to the injustices of adulthood that we've all faced. Ironically, the lyrics and driving music give us some sort of satisfaction in the face of getting no satisfaction from uh, whatever trial we're up against. Despite the annoyance about manipulative TV advertising and jaggers when I'm watching my TV and that man comes on to tell me how white my shirts can be. Snickers, a Snickers candy bar, was determined to use the song for their Snickers Satisfied television campaign and eventually license I Can't Get No Satisfaction for $4 million. But even with all that money, Snickers did not get the use of uh, the original version by the Rolling Stones. The commercial, which aired in the early 90s, featured a, a version of the song performed by studio musicians. I, can't get no I suppose that's the best way to end this piece. You know, rock and roll has its own contradictions. It's a bittersweet symphony. Leave us a comment about this majestic rock song. What are your memories or experiences relating to it? Let us know in the comments. It's such an amazing song. If you like this video, we do invite you to subscribe below and make sure to click the bell so that you never miss out. Make sure to check us out on Patreon as well. You can also check out our new merch. That helps us keep the music alive. Until next time, you know what to do. Three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.